history of uh, the last 250 years uh, misshaped our understanding in a way. It gave the idea that the world is led by the West, naturally. Well, this is completely non-historical. It's a specific moment of history, a rather astounding moment because the steam engine mechanization, the factory world, industrialization, the atomic age, this was led by the West. Uh, and so the technological impulse was so strong, the dynamism was so strong, the military advantage was so strong that the British Empire ruled the oceans. And then after two world wars, at the end of 1945, Britain was uh, exhausted and uh, handed the leadership to the United States, basically, or the US grabbed the baton. And the US thought, now we run the world. After 1991, when the Soviet Union ended, the American mindset was, now we really run the world. No competitors, no nothing, because we had one competitor, the Soviet Union, it doesn't even exist anymore. And they didn't even imagine. If you look back in the early 1990s, China wasn't mentioned. China, that's villages, they grow rice. What, what do we have to do with that? So they had no idea what was going to happen over the next 30 years, that China was going to have the most phenomenal catching up. And China, by 2010, had developed a, a real middle income country. But then China started to innovate. Now, this was something completely unexpected. Starting around 2015, China is suddenly at the, at the frontier of innovation in many, many areas. And then the US policymakers said, wait, that's not in our script. We run the world. What's this China business? This is where the problem lies right now. We don't have an understanding of this. Uh, the US still talks about, well, we need a world in which we run the world because of our Western values. Well, China does not want the United States to run the world. China, I believe, wants to cooperate. I do not believe, based on all I know about China and all I know about 2,200 years of Chinese history since the unification of China, that China has any aspiration to go conquer the world or threaten Greece or threaten the United States. I don't believe it at all. It's a long story, but I don't believe it at all. I think we need to learn to live together. Now, if you think about this multipolar order, India is now developing very fast. It's now the most populous country because it overtook, according to the best data we have, China uh, earlier this year. Africa, if you consider it a union rather than 54 separate countries, it's the same population, 1.4 billion, as India and as China. Each one is going to be a center of world polarity of civilization. Latin America, which has been very divided and very uh, unhappy experience, has a, a lot of people, a huge region, huge resources needed for the world. So I'm looking for a world in which North America, uh, South America, Europe, European Union, African Union, uh, the uh, Arab region, uh, Russia, Central Asia, South Asia, East Asia, actually work within the regions peacefully and cooperate across the regions, rather than all this talk about will we have a new war between China and the US, aside from the fact that it would quite possibly end the world. What a waste of time to talk about war when we have climate change to attend to, when we have technological change to attend to, when we have serious work to do for human well-being. What are they talking about? Why are we spending $2.2 trillion on armaments right now? Why is my country, the United States, spending 40% of all the arms purchases in the world or military spending? We're 40% of the worldwide $2.2 trillion. That is awful because inside the United States, we've got poverty. We've got falling life expectancy. We've got mass shootings almost every day. So what are they talking about war? How about fixing inside the United States? How do you see the US strategy towards China? 
I think the U.S. strategy towards China is a complete blunder by people who I suspect have never been to China and who know no history. The mindset of the U.S., and when I say the U.S., I mean the security establishment. The mindset of the U.S. security establishment is China's a threat, uh, and we need to make sure that China, that we remain dominant over China. That's uh, quite, quite an idea because China is four times larger than the United States. And, but they got the idea starting around 2015, we need to hinder China's development. They won't put it that way because governments have stories. No, we don't want to hurt you. But what they really want to do is slow China's development. They want to keep high technology away. The Chinese have figured that out, that this is not goodwill. This is not simply about arms. Because if it were about armaments, we'd have arms control discussions. This is about competition. Who's number one? As an economist, I, frankly, I don't think in those terms because we want prosperity in both places from my point of view. But if you're a security uh, leader, apparently your biggest thought is who's number one and who's below you, which to my mind is a strange way to think about the world anyway, but that is the mindset. So the U.S. has made many unilateral moves, very strange ideas. Uh, President Obama already, and he's one of our more rational leaders, he started negotiations on the Trans-Pacific Partnership with the explicit idea, let's have a trading arrangement in Asia with the United States that doesn't include China. What kind of thinking is that? So I think the U.S. approach has been wrong. And one of the things about Chinese statecraft, just like Confucianism, by the way, Confucian was a lot about ritual and proper relationship. And ritual mattered in that you need to give proper respect. On China, are you concerned for a possible conflict on the relations, on the United States relation with China? Uh, Emmanuel Macron, the French president, said recently that the Europeans and France should not follow the United States when it comes to Taiwan. Europe needs a foreign policy. This is no secret. Europe doesn't have a foreign policy right now. Europe has a NATO policy, which means a U.S. policy. Frankly, the Europeans don't care. Is the U.S. number one or China number one? It's not the European interest. The idea of this number one is a comic book version of the world. It's not the real ver version of the world. But the U.S. is actually aiming to implicate Europe in, its, in the U.S. contest with China. This is bad for the economy and bad for security of Europe. And even worse, and I resent it also as an American, the U.S. began to invite Asian leaders to NATO. The last time I looked, NATO meant North Atlantic Treaty Organization. It did not mean Pacific. And it should not be involved in Asian affairs. All this does is put Europe deeper and deeper into geopolitical strife that is not Europe's cause, it's not Europe's purpose, it's not Europe's interest. On the uh, war in Ukraine, you're very critical about the United States foreign policy. You're at the same time critical for the Russian brutal invasion. Do you see any prospects for peace and uh, a way out soon? If one looks at this conflict objectively, which is very hard to do because we're not getting an objective account, we have an incredible war of attrition and bloodshed in Ukraine, which is first and foremost killing Ukraine. All of this great talk about, oh, we're going to drive Russia out of you know, every inch, including Crimea and so forth, never made any sense, never had any truth to it, was guaranteed to put Ukraine into violence, war, and bloodshed for years to come. And frankly, at age 68, as I am, and I've lived through Vietnam, 
Laos, Cambodia, the Contra Wars, Iraq, Afghanistan, Syria, Libya, Serbia, uh, and uh, now Ukraine. Enough. Go sit and negotiate. That's my feeling. In the United States, next year in 2024, we're going to have presidential elections. It seems that so far we're going to have the main candidates are President Biden, who is going to be next year 82. He does a good job right now at the White House, but he's going to be 82. And on the Republican side, uh, Donald Trump. We all know Donald Trump, and we experienced his presidency. How come the American system cannot have another dynamic leader, another dynamic candidate that could inspire people and lead the world? I think there's a very sad truth right now about the United States, which friends of the United States don't want to hear, but it's true, and that is we have been unable to solve internal problems in the U.S. for decades now. We can't get agreement on anything. We can't get agreement on taking care of our kids. We can't get agreement on guns. We can't get agreement on any issue at all. Our politics is wrecked. It was wrecked actually by corruption, first and foremost, by big money, because next year's presidential campaign will probably spend $15 billion at least. So you see all these billionaires lining up. Uh, well, I'll give the, this one to the Democrats, this one to the Republicans, but they're billionaires. What do they want? They want low taxes and no, no environmental regulation. So the general problem in the United States is the political system is generally dysfunctional and corrupted. Biden, in my opinion, has no business running again. I'm sorry, an 81-year-old who will be 82 and 86 if he were to be reelected, and he's not in great shape. In my view, just I'm no doctor or expert, but I'm watching him. Retire, thank you very much. Time to move on. Let a, a new generation come in. Uh, and Trump will have so many lawsuits by the time this thing comes. It's, it's stunning how sad this is. So I believe that one other experience of American presidential politics is you never know if you have two lead candidates, one of whom is being indicted left and right, and the other is really fumbling physically right now in many different contexts. I think we have to wait and see who the real candidates are going to be next year. Uh, but uh, in any event, the whole system is not working well. And unfortunately, the US uh, has been unable to sit down and discuss internally how we make our politics work better. Mm -hmm. Finally, uh, some experts on uh, global uh, challenges include the use of technologies new technologies, the AI, that might disrupt the world if are not these technologies properly used. Are you concerned? We should really be concerned. First, amazed, number one. Second, uh, in many ways, admiring. But then third, deeply concerned about the technological revolutions underway. It's not only AI, it's science and even more than science, technology has exploded in all sorts of advances. You can see in the Ukraine war every day, this is not a war even like you would have seen a year or two or three years ago, but it's across society right now, whether it's uh, uh, computation, whether it's connectivity, whether it's artificial intelligence, whether it's robotics, whether it's advanced biotechnology, and on and on. So you realize these technologies are out of control. Some people want to make trillions of dollars out of them. Some people want to blow up the world with them. Some people want to make biowarfare with them. Nobody can govern them. And this is a huge problem. And, and the problems are three. One, almost nobody understands what's going on. If we're not technically led through this, and it took me months to really understand a lot of this, and I was working real hard at it. It's very hard, so very concentrated knowledge. Uh, second problem is power coming from this. Knowledge is power, said Francis Bacon in 1605. 
whether it's military power, financial power, they don't want to tell us what's going on. They've got the power. And the third problem, and it's related to this, at least in the U.S. context, all serious governance is secret right now. So to come back to Greek democracy, you know, uh, the Athenians went to uh, the Agora or went to the Acropolis or went to the as assembly, and they heard the arguments. People discussed them. Pericles gave his lectures. Didn't always work out perfectly, but things were discussed. In America right now, almost nothing is discussed. We have narrative. We don't have deliberation. Narrative is what the government wants us to believe, and the New York Times, I'm afraid, or the Washington Post or the Wall Street Journal prints with unnamed senior officials. I happen to be, because of my jobs and role in life, I happen to be privy to a lot more discussion than you can find in the media. They're lying all the time. I don't like that, because how are we going to have a democracy? if it's not based on transparency and truth. U.S. and Western craziness, boneheadedness, it wasn't even the decisive factor in this because even when, when uh, Putin came into power, he was absolutely pro-European. There's no doubt about it. And I know many European leaders that dealt, dealt closely with him, friends of mine, people who are absolutely wonderful leaders who said, of course, he was extremely cooperative. So even with all of the blunders, which were terrible mistakes, even in the early 2000s, this could have been rectified. But this plan of NATO enlargement was so relentless. There was uh, Victoria Newland at every step, by the way. That's the amazing where's Waldo kind of thing, because she is the Deputy National Security Advisor for Cheney. Then she's the U.S. Ambassador to NATO. Then she's the spokesperson spokesperson for uh, the uh, uh, the State Department for Hillary Clinton. Uh, then she's the Assistant Secretary of State on the Maidan. Now she's the Under Secretary of State. So if there's one person who personifies the constant uh, thread of this, it's 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 Newland. But this could have been avoided so many times, you know, if one tries to interpret, uh, I, I, I'm trying to interpret this, uh, this craziness because there were so many warnings. Don't try this at home. Don't do this by our leading, you know, our greatest uh, uh, diplomat, George Kennan, was extremely clear, of course. Bill Burns, our CIA director, who was the uh, ambassador to Russia in, uh, in, in uh, 2008, wrote an absolutely vivid memo, Niet means Niet. Of course, like everything, uh, Alexander, and I think this is part of the point, everything is secret except that one showed up on WikiLeaks. Yeah. So the public hears nothing, yeah. nothing about the debates, not a word. And our dumb newspapers, not a word, except whatever the government tells them to say. And so in 2008, my view is they just couldn't believe that they wouldn't get away with whatever they wanted. First, the Orange Revolution. OK, we'll just get it through with Yushchenko as president. Didn't quite work out. Then NATO. OK, we'll do that. Then, then came Yanukovych. How the hell did he become president again? Now we have neutrality again. That was unacceptable. Then they thought, okay, we can dump him. Uh, we can overthrow him. And uh, and there was uh, Victoria Newland handing out cookies on the Maidan. And I happened to catch a glimpse of, uh, of this myself. And it was disgusting, the U.S. role in the violent overthrow of Yanukovych. But they thought they could get away with it, that a new government would come in and then it would start. And they believed until the end. I'm quite convinced that Putin was bluffing that he would never launch a, a, a military effort against NATO enlargement, that in the end he would back down, he would, we'll see him through the bluff. And when he did 
launched the uh, special operation in February 24th, 2022. He did it with the view, in my opinion, that Ukraine would come to the negotiating table quickly, that this was basically to get the negotiations that the United States had rejected at the end of 2021. And indeed, immediately Zelensky said, yeah, we could be neutral. Uh, We just need security guarantees. A pretty basic point, by the way, that was the last lucid moment of Zelensky. I don't know what what his private (laughs) attitudes are, but it was the last statement that he made of any honesty, in my opinion, about the fate of Ukraine. He said, we can be neutral. We need security guarantees. This fighting should stop. And then we know it almost did stop until the United States stopped the stopping of the war by intervening and saying, don't you dare agree to negotiate. So they continued their fantasy world that Putin's at an end. He'll never mobilize and our sanctions will kill him. And everything is bluff, in my opinion, and tremendous miscalculation because these people are not very bright. And they do not calculate the next move. And they have no understanding of the move on the other side. And so this is why there's no negotiation, because they can't think. They keep thinking whatever they read in the newspaper, which is, by the way, whatever the government has told the newspaper to publish. So they believe their own press releases, which is astounding because the press releases are so obviously phony. So it seems to me, you know, the conclusion of all of this is if it's right that they've run out of ammunition, this is what we're going to find out. This is probably the only fact that is going to actually determine something. Uh, Mm. And uh, it's sad to say because this was so utterly avoidable for 30 years. This was utterly avoidable for the last two years. It could have been stopped in March 2022. It could have been stopped at Vilnius last week and there been a shred of honesty. And by the way, I can tell tell you two gentlemen that um, I had, uh, and I, I won't say more than what I'm going to say, but I, I had a talk with uh, a, a brief talk, but a substantive talk with uh, one of Europe's leaders. Uh, and uh, I expressed my views and uh, I was told, you're exactly right. And then the same leader said exactly the opposite uh, at Vilnius. (laughs) So, you know, you watch this close up and people are dying. It's just, it's unbelievable. Yes. Yes. It's unbelievable that we can't be honest long enough to sit down and stop the killing and make the politics to stop the killing because it's not that hard. 